well. Yeah, he had some fantasy relevant weeks, so yeah. that could be that could be looked at as a uh, gla- glass half full. All right, boys, I pressed the rig, the big red button. We got way too much, way too many topics. The NFL just so generous to us this year, uh, especially the last few hours, few minutes, few days, few weeks, whichever way you want to look at it. We're going to hit on a bunch of that tonight. Guys, let's get right into it. District, you know, Pope listens. Dynasty of religion for the blokes missing on all of these raids, on all of these plays, on all of these raids. By the end of the day, y'all getting paid. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex. Send the homie a text. That trash off is the best. You try to make it complex. Then they text you back. Now, all of a sudden, they don't make any sense. <laughs> Broaden your horizon, boy. Dynasty's not for Simon's boy. Trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T District, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's the... And I always be traded. And I always be traded. And I always be traded. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Bait them. Fish. What is up, Fantasyland? We are back in the district. And as I said before, we, we pressed the intro, man. The NFL is just dropping the goodness this week, guys. Today, smashing, blowing up our minds once again. As you see, a happy Colts fan over here with Matty Ice at the commands in Indy. We're going to touch on all that tonight. First, guys, let's give one of these to Dan. Dan, Dan living the, the, the retired life. At What concerts he had tonight, Theo? I believe he might be at a Journey concert, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what band, but I think it might be Journey. I fucking love it. I should have had the clip ready for that. Anyways, it's all good, man. It's all good, Mario. Welcome back, brother. Welcome back to the district. We had to have you back on this week. Thanks for having me. It's it's great to be here, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll try to get something right this time. When I scheduled uh, when I scheduled Mario, um, he said, "Well, try to have me on this date because I think the Tyreek Hill thing is going to go down uh, the day before." So you yeah. were off by a couple hours. That was that was glad we had that one. Right. Can, you nailed it. You nailed it. You guys nailed it, man. Like the perfect uh, synchronized swimming there between you two scheduling that. I mean, guys, there's so much goodness to get into. Last uh, Theo, we the three of us, you, Dan, and I, were on with Billy and a shark infested water draft. Um, remind me the site that we drafted on and where so we, the peeps can find it. We did a, um, a 24 round best ball draft on play FFWC. Um, the, it was hosted by uh, Billy Muzio from full-time fantasy. Um, it was a, it was a great draft. It, you know, Adam, Adam Krautwurst was in this draft, Dan, JD, myself. Um, we had, a, a ton of a ton of very very good drafters um billy drafted as well um bradley stadler i mean you go down the list it was it was it was a great draft there's some great analysts and some great players um and it was a really uh big time mental exercise to do that 24 rounder there was no kickers so it was uh it's an interesting format we highly recommend you uh check it out um but it was uh if anybody's looking to see the uh the youtube of it um Check out the uh, Full Time Fantasy podcast, um, play FFWC, and um, Billy Muzio should have it all all linked. Um, but it was awesome. I mean, I, I liked my draft. I don't know what you thought, JD, but it was uh, definitely tough tough uh, towards the end. It's a wide receiver heavy format, um, so I, I tried to to get as many good receivers as possible, and I, I feel like I like my wide receiver build. Yeah, I, I was trying to not. I, I gotta say, man, I was fumbling around on that that platform. I, I gotta admit, I've only done one slow draft on that platform. Billy invited me to a slow draft that they were doing, and then uh, he asked me to do this live one. And I thought I was able to maneuver it on my screens and stuff, but I, it was it was really difficult for me to maneuver it. I figured it out kind of more towards the end, but you know what? It was super fun. I learned a lot just because of the guys that were in that draft, 
And like you said, Theo, it's a different format than, you know, the, the usual underdogs and FFPCs that we talk about on the show. Three receiver starters, like you said, no kicker, but there are defenses. Um, just a, a really good draft, 24 rounds. Go check it out, guys. Strong recommend if you do best ball or even thinking about it. Uh, even just for redraft, you'll get a lot of tidbits from some really sharp players. And if you want to see the board itself, uh, Jared Smola and 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 uh, Mike Shop from from Draft Sharks, also two very very sharp guys, were also in this draft. And I believe Jared or Draft Sharks posted the board itself. So if you don't want to watch us, you don't want to watch the uh, the YouTube or or listen to the podcast, you can just go look at the board, and I think that'll be helpful as well. But at the end of the day, Tyreek Hill gets traded a, a day after the draft, so the board will be a change in, in many, many formats. My Herbert over Mahomes pick looking a little sexier now than it was uh, when you guys were calling me out on it. Looking sharp. So yeah, I'm excited, excited tonight. We have Mario on. Um, if anybody does not follow him, um, he's a great follow on Twitter. His articles on Rotowire are very, very good, and he's very frequent with his writing. And he also is putting out a ton of very useful podcasts on Rotowire. Um I see you You have multiple people you're podcasting with um, right now, Mario. Yeah, I mostly work with my colleague, John McKechnie. Uh, we do, I guess, yeah, weekly for as long as the foreseeable future for, for uh, I don't know, I guess we might have done it like every week for the past year and I didn't even notice it yet. We might just do it year round all the time. And then during the season or uh, probably at some point in the summer, more likely we get an expanded roster at that point and start doing it, I think uh, at least five days a week, but I always do it once a week with John. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, we highly recommend it. Uh, it's a good one to subscribe to. They dropped Thank you a, very much, uh, by the way. Ty, Tyree kill reaction one today, which I'm looking forward to, uh, to listening to. Yeah, guys go check that out. I I've already gone through, I think three quarters or even a bit more of that and, and just some good tidbits. Uh, so go check that out. After you've listened uh, to this one, you can download and subscribe uh, to Mario's show over there at uh, Rotowire. And he's at the Posting the, Scout. The Posting Scout, yes. Yeah. On, on, on Twitter, explain that to me real quick. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, making fun of both myself and I guess it would be Matt Miller, but just that general archetype of uh, you know the, the NFL scout who is on the internet and posts too much. Uh, and I, I think we both qualify, and I was kind of like following his uh, at NFL Draft Scout kind of aesthetic lead there. Nice. I like I like when there's a little story behind it, right, Theo? Makes it a little, a little more fun. I like to know the inside joke, too. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys, let's get, let's get into this one. Uh, you know, we already talked about it. It's hard not to start with Miami, Kansas City. Huge monster move. Uh, I mean... Actually, you know what, Theo? I don't know if you have the deets. If not, I'll pull it up while uh, while I throw out the first question on this one. But Tyree Kill going to Miami in a monster move. I don't think anyone expected this. I don't know if you guys have any other info on that, but I didn't see any of that I anywhere. <laughs> uh, just last night, I, I joked that I did a, an underdog before I went to sleep and, and stacked, you know, the Hill, Mahomes, and, and uh, Kelsey right out the gate. So uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, th- those hurt a bit. I'll go to you first. So- Oh, sorry. So the, the the trade the trade was Tyree yeah. Kill goes to Miami. Kansas City receives the, the a first round pick, a late one, twenty nine overall. Uh, they also get a second round pick, fiftieth overall, um, a fourth round pick, and then they get fourth and sixth round picks in next year's draft. So they got five draft picks, but only only one day one selection and a and a day two selection. So it wasn't. I, I don't think it was an overwhelming. Uh, payment. I think I've seen some people taking the taking a, you know, uh, Kansas City should have gotten a lot more. Um, some people have said, you know, it's a great it's a great day for Kansas City to get all those draft picks for a guy that might have left next year anyway. Um, any way you cut it, whichever stance you take, it was still just a massive, significant move, and it seemed to kind of come out of left field too. There wasn't like a whole lot of Tyreek Hills getting ch- uh, traded all last week, which I think that was kind of the the shocking thing is just how quickly things move um, this off season, even with like Deshaun Watson going to Cleveland where, you know, we were thinking new Orleans, Carolina, and then all of a sudden it just becomes Cleveland. Um, and now, you know, how you've tried Tyree kill basically the, the trade just happens so quickly. I mean, I think that was the most shocking thing for it. Um, we've seen Devonte Adams get traded. So we've already seen a huge wide receiver get moved, but it was just kind of how, how quickly this happened for me. That was the biggest takeaway. 
Yeah, the Devante thing at least took like a week to brew up in this thing. And I, I didn't keep, you know, stopwatch track of it, but it felt like it was only like 20 minutes or something that uh, whoever it was, Schefter or Rappaport, I guess both of them probably were saying like, hey, the uh, Jets, Dolphins, they're talking to the Chiefs and didn't take long after that. Uh, blindsided me totally. Um, I guess you can understand it easily enough for both teams. I mean, the Dolphins, they're giving to a, a, a really good, good shot here even with a bad offensive line I think with with receivers like Hill and Jalen Waddle no excuses at all uh whereas before he could have had an excuse maybe a little bit of an excuse if he if he kept struggling that's no longer the case and then the Chiefs it's just got to be a money issue like I don't know I don't know if there was anything they could have done to avoid it especially after they had to pay Pat Mahomes his extension but uh basically you don't get rid of a player like Tyreek Hill unless the money's kind of forcing you because you can't replace him uh, with whatever your savings are. So keeping this, cause we could go a million directions. I mean, this is a very interesting trade. He's, he's now what the highest paid or the, the highest paid wide receiver ever, right. In the NFL, 120 million. Is that what I saw? Uh, that's so that was like a four year, 120 million figure. Right. I, that's weird. I think, so I heard, or I saw on Twitter initially something like three for 75. So I don't know if there's, um, Oh, you know, okay. conditional payments or something in there okay. somewhere. Uh, but yeah, suffice to say, it was a it was a big number, big enough that it convinced the Chiefs to let go of a guy that you know they they you can barely define them uh, without him, and yet they made that move. So let me ask you, like, kind of going from a macro and then moving in, where do you see the power shift move now? Because um, this affects two different d- divisions in the AFC. Obviously, it affects a powerhouse in K- KC. And yeah. you, we, we kind of saw this Miami team sneaking up and, and building slowly and then making a huge splash. So where do you see the, the ripple effect happen in these divisions or in, in the FC? So Tyreek is a player that the Chiefs can't replace. It's just impossible. But Mahomes, if, if he's as good as we think he is, if he's, you know, top two or the best quarterback in the league, then he should be able to stay pretty dangerous as long as they get somebody like Chris Olave or Jamison Williams with that first round pick, because um, I like Miko Hardman, but I think he's more like a good third pass catcher and a good, uh, a good passing offense. And I think that uh, he's, he's good as like a downfield decoy, I guess. Uh, like he, he's, he's the kind of deep threat who, if the defense doesn't take him seriously, he can make them pay for it. But I think when you go from Tyreek Hill to the next guy, you need you need someone who can actually threaten consistently upfield. And players like Olave and Jameson Williams, I think, are more in that category. Like they're guys who both have the speed uh, to make the defense pay and the kind of like the route running ability to threaten pretty much every play that they're out there for from a variety of routes on the outside. Uh, so I think the Chiefs can still stay really dangerous if if they pick one of those receivers basically and get them up to speed quickly. Um, but even if they do, there's no doubt about it. All, all of the chargers, Broncos, uh, Raiders gained ground on them with this. And, and that's just, that's just the fact. I don't know if they can really change that particular part of it. And in the dolphins case, I don't know. I'm, I don't like Mike McDaniel might be okay. I don't, I don't really know where he's headed. I can't tell what kind of coach he is exactly. And, you know, he could be a good coach and still fail with the dolphins with how, dysfunctional sometimes their front office and ownership can be um but with players like these i don't know it's it's kind of even with a bad offensive line you you and and maybe even a bad quarterback like tyreek hill and jalen waddle and gasicki there uh it's gonna be tough to cover him with with hill's speed on the field um they they could be kind of competitive especially if you know if the bills have just an off year for some reason i I think by the way the patriots are kind of on the downswing either way Uh, i don't really like the way their roster is headed so uh, Dolphins, if they don't at the very least get a wild card berth, it would be pretty disappointing. But at the same time, I don't really see them as like a serious playoff team. Theo, does this worry you for KC pieces? Like I saw our buddy Swag, you know, put out a tweet saying Kelsey is is a trade right now, is a is a sell. Are you worried about this KC offense, like fantasy wise? I'm talking fantasy players. Is there are you have, is there a sell anywhere in there? Do you, are you worried about that offense as a whole? I I feel like. If if that's the sentiment, then Kelsey is probably a buy. If 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 the if the market wants to wants to sell Travis Kelsey, I usually am taking the opposite approach, and, I, and I'm trying to trying to get those guys cheap. I think that there's 
Travis Kelsey, I think that it's a very safe bet that he's going to be a top three tight end. And I think that there's a chance that he's tight end one overall again. I think it would be, I think we'd probably put that as a, you know, 30 to 40% chance, something, something high, higher than 25% chance of him being tight end one overall. Now Um, I think he's going to get peppered with targets. Um, You also have to factor in the fact that it doesn't seem like a big fantasy thing, but Byron Pringle was lost. He he signed with another team. Um, Demarcus Robinson signed with another team. Um, They, they get Juju Smith Schuster, which we were all very, very happy about the landing spot. It's an ideal landing spot for Juju um, especially now, but it's still a, a, a free agent signing um, and free agent wide receivers don't usually come and you know, set the world on fire. So Travis Kelsey is about as sure a thing as it gets in terms of a guy that Pat Mahomes is going to pepper with targets. So from a fantasy perspective, I don't think this really moves anything um, for Kelsey. Uh, you could, you can make an argument um, like Mario said, it's impossible to replace Tyree kill stylistically. So maybe the entire offense as a whole takes a step down, maybe, there's potentially less less red zone opportunity and that sort of thing, um, but I, I, it doesn't change anything for me with with uh, with Travis Kelsey at all. What about Mahomes? Like, does he does it bring it down your ranking, guys, at all with Mahomes? Well, it's, I think for me, Josh Allen's QB one overall, and if and if there was it was any kind of trepidation with that, and there was still some Mahomes QB one, um, I think that it's it's a surefire Josh Allen QB one overall right now. Um, I love Mahomes. But I, I think Allen is just the safest bet right now for QB one overall. Shout out to Wheeler. Sorry guys, that was my mistake. I dropped a, all all the all the uh, the marketing and stuff. I threw that out there with the nine thirty time uh, that we usually rock. So I apologize, guys, that we're on early tonight. <laughs> Hopefully you guys catch it. You can go back and start over. And uh, shout out to Wheeler, Joey Brown, uh, always in the chat. We appreciate you guys. And Matt disagreeing a bit with uh, with Mario. He's he's liking the Nicole Hardman, but I'm I'm with Mario there. I've had him on my rosters enough time the last few years. Dan and I, uh, on some redrafts, some big tournaments, uh, kind of feeling like we, you know, didn't get our money's worth on him. Um, and then, you know, let's, uh, let's, is there anyone well, I just else? See what, oh, where's Mario at on, on Mahomes? If just initial QB oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, for, re, for redraft, redraft. Yeah. yeah, I think it's got to be a downgrade for him. Uh, but yeah, I would also say that it is, uh, it's treading water for Kelsey. So if his price dropped, I, I think he's a buy then. Who who climbs ahead of Mahomes, if anyone? Uh, Kev seems to think Lamar. I I, I, gotta... uh, I wouldn't, I, I love Lamar, but I, I think Greg Roman is definitely one of the worst offensive coordinators in the league. So I'm, I'm kind of pessimistic there, even if their offensive line gets better, even with, you know, the running backs back to hopefully help them out a little bit. I'm, I'm concerned for Lamar. Uh, Josh Allen is, uh, you know, not the running threat that Lamar or maybe a couple other guys are, but he's a lot more and a lot more frequently utilized that way than Patrick Mahomes. And unlike Mahomes, Josh Allen, I think has a loaded surrounding cast right now. So mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Josh Allen, and um, yeah, I don't think there's anyone else that I have up there. Uh, so probably Allen at one, and then Mahomes and a group of uh, maybe just himself in the second tier, but a second tier, I think. Yeah, I think that that's the, I think that's the, the way to look at it. I, I think that um, when you start talking about QB two, I think there's going to be some people giving different different answers right now. I just think it's it's kind of Allen. Then a slight, slight tear break. Um, where yeah, what about CH about- guys? Joey Brown asking about CH, Theo. What do you think about the backfields? Actually, I want to ask about the backfields in both these offenses, Miami and KC. Are they ones are we avoiding, or is CH kind of a still a buy at his value? I don't. Uh, oh, sorry. You go. You go. Start out with this one, Mario. Well, I was going to say. Um, I think Clyde Edwards Hilaire can run. Uh, in skill way, like I don't, I don't know if he can take on the volume, but I think when he gets the ball as a runner, he's he's pretty good in that offense. I, I don't know what to make of his injuries that, as they've piled up, and uh, more importantly, I don't, I don't have any idea what the the Chiefs think about it. Like if the Chiefs are going into this draft thinking we got to get somebody to take the load off of Clyde Edwards Hilaire because we can't count, count on Clyde Edwards Hilaire to stay healthy, they would kind of be reasonable to conclude that, I guess. And Clyde Edwards Hilaire is. Five seven two oh four or something like that. He's not even supposed to be uh, a true work, workhorse like at all along. Even when we were high on him, it wasn't even in theory supposed to be a workhorse kind of player. It's more like twelve carries, four or five catches, and 
the catches have been the problem too in a lot of uh, even aside from the durability there hasn't been that pass catching production with Edward Hilaire and I know uh, this doesn't matter to anyone who's invested in Edward Hilaire and kind of you know been disappointed by him but I don't think it's his fault I think like when defenses see him on the field they make sure there's a linebacker to watch his route when they drop it off to him so I, I see people wondering all the time like how is it that every time Clyde Edwards uh, Hilaire catches a pass he's getting tackled after five yards right away and then Daryl Williams does it uh, six times in a game and running after the catch for 10 yards no That's problem true. every time there's no one in frame and it's like yeah I don't I don't know what to do about it to fix it but the defense cares when Edward Hilaire is on the field and they don't when those other guys are out there so they either need to figure out some way to make the defense pay for for watching Edward Hilaire and, and since it didn't work the last two years I don't know what changes there or they have to get that much more going on the ground. And it's like, I don't know how much his frame can take up there. So I think Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is in a difficult spot, and I think he's a good player. But I, I do worry about uh, them practically utilizing him as a pass catcher. And as a runner, I, I worry that they, you know, kind of reasonably are worried that his frame can't take 15 carries a game. So I, shout out to Wheeler in the chat. It brings up Rojo. I saw the Rojo to KC uh, rumors as well. Uh, I think I've all I've also seen them being linked to drafting a running back potentially in the second round or third round. Um, so I think there could end up being some competition. CH would not be one that I would go out and, and try to actively buy in Dynasty. I've seen some sharp players buy him low um, in some leagues I'm in. Guys that I respect respect their opinions on um, buy him low, but it would have to be pretty low for me. Um, I think he's the kind of guy you might get burned trading like a, you know not trying to put a, a, a number on it, but I wouldn't go offering like, you know, the one Oh seven for him right now. I would kind of let things oh, shake no. out. Um, but I, I think some people I've seen some people trade second rounders for him. That's how the market is very low on, on CEH and dynasty right now in redraft. Um, I've drafted him in the, I, in an NFFC best ball draft. I drafted him in like the seventh round. I think that's a, that's a reasonable place to take a stab at if you're doing early best balls. Um, he's occasionally falling out uh, like into the, you know, the nineties, eighties, like he's going pretty close to a hundred in some of these best ball drafts. So I think the market's pretty low for CH. This certainly, um, it, the only argument for this would be, it might create more touches for him, but I don't like, like we said, uh, you know, a running back like, like CH, you'd want him to have opportunities in the red zone and green zone to kind of pay off big time. And Unless unless some things really shake out, the offense as a whole probably won't be as strong. So, I, again, I don't I don't I wouldn't recommend going out and buying him. Now the Miami backfield is super interesting to me right now because I, I am interested in Chase Edmonds. Mostert. Um, I'm not as interested in in Mostert. I think Mostert is like Mostert is familiarity with the system. Does does he um, lo- he loses with Hill coming in? No, because he's kind of gadgety a bit. I think it's. I don't know if I don't know if and if if either one if necessarily loses. I think it's like Edmonds is the one that they they put they put money into. They gave him like six point five guaranteed. They paid him like two years twelve. Um, and I think Edmonds is younger. He's certainly the better receiver. He's the running back that they brought in first. They brought in in Mostert second. I I I, I know that shouldn't that shouldn't really be a factor in, but Edmonds seems like the person that they targeted. Um, they needed a running back. They went out and got Edmonds. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the situation. I think Edmonds could end up being one of these guys um, that could be a, a RB2 or, or a useful flex in this offense. I mean, you have two of the fastest wide receivers in the league now, um, and you have a tight end who, who can stretch the field. Um, I believe in Mike McDaniel's ability to scheme. I mean, Edmonds should have opportunities with his touches. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a guy that's – and I was talking to Mario about this in the in the pre-show. The fact that they traded away all these draft picks is also a great thing for Edmonds. They don't have a draft pick until the the end of the third round now. Um, and oh, they're I'm pretty both, safe. Yeah, they're pretty safe. So, so, so I think you're gonna you're gonna. I think that was one of the fears was they're gonna have just some crowded, you know, backfield and they'll take one of these guys in like the second or third round potentially. That that ship has sailed. It's it's Edmonds and and Moster. You can get Edmonds still pretty cheap, and you can get Mostert dirt cheap. So um, I have some Edmonds in Dynasty. I, I'd like to get a little more, um, and I think he's the kind of player. I don't think he's he's not, he's not a league winner type, but I think he will pay off at, at, at his current ADP, and I think he'll rise up a little bit. 
um, maybe into that dead zone uh, as the summer goes along. What do you think, Mario? Yeah, Edmonds is pretty interesting. Like he seems like he's a pretty good player. Uh, I think both him and James Conner played well with the Cardinals last year. So uh, the way those two split it was Edmonds taking most of the passing down work, uh, or you know, some safe majority of it, and Conner getting more like the short yardage, uh, you know, red zone stuff, whatever. Um, with the Dolphins, I think there's going to be a split similar in that, like I, I think Mostert might be there. Mostert could actually start at running back, and it would be more, one of those like ceremonial things where he starts because their base loadout is, you know, with, they want to have a run play action threat on the field, and, and they want to establish that, you know, outside run threat with Mostert, and try to try to get the defense worrying about the speed both underneath and vertically, try to get them off balance. And then Edmonds is the one who's probably going to play upwards of two thirds of the actual snaps because anytime they're, yeah, anytime there's a route for the running back, it's going to be Edmonds on the field. So. He might be off the bench technically, but he should lead them in snaps and he should get almost a monopoly on the pass catching work there, uh, which it, particularly with the offensive line being kind of concerning, that's that's a good thing. If he can get a lot of targets, uh, especially in PPR, you wouldn't really care if he's struggling to average four yards a carry. Yeah, I, I get. I don't know if you guys you – ever, you ever date that girl, you know, like she's really attractive, you're totally into her, but like she wears that perfume that just – you know, like the super flowery one you're just not into because it reminds you of your mom or something. I feel like Edmonds is that girl. Like, what has he given you? At most, he's given you two top 12 weeks uh, in 2020. We've seen him in a pretty good offense in Arizona. I mean, yeah, we saw Duke Johnson look good in Miami at the end of last year, right? Which is encouraging. And now you've got Tyree Kill opening up opening it up with Waddle. So yeah, I totally get that. I just, Edmonds to me, I just don't know if he's that guy that's going to do it. He gave you what five last year, one, one top 12, five top 24s. I, he just, I don't know. He just doesn't do it for me. Um, when I'm drafting, he doesn't offer me the up, upside that I'm looking for. But I think the price is already baked in, you know? So I, I don't think you're having to overpay for him. Yeah. Edmonds' right. price probably is going to go up a bit, right? Like I, I guess I don't know what all the sites are showing right now, but I just, was looking at the NFFC stuff, not that so many who, drafts. Who would you rather have, Mario, uh, Ch- uh, Chase Edmonds or Miles Sanders? Uh, probably Edmonds in PPR at the very least. Deal? Uh, and maybe in standard too. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I might be on Team Edmonds right now. I was a big Miles Sanders guy before, but I, I think that that's a guy that, that could get hurt in the NFL draft, um, plus the fact that it's crowded with Gainwell and Scott. Um, and a coach that's shown a willingness to use multiple backs. We also just don't know what Mike McDaniel is going to run uh, offensively. Like, I think there's been a lot of people who think he's just going to be some Shanahan clone. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily see that. I think he's going to kind of do his own thing. He's a. Uh, it seems he's like a, they're going to kind of like a spread almost kind of theory. And, they have yeah, Cedric Wilson there too. Yeah, that's a good point. And and. Parker is still around, um, I believe. He's is he still under contract, Devontae Parker? I would expect them to move him, but he is, yeah. So they're they're deep at receiver and they have two guys where they're gonna try their best to, you know, manufacture yak, try to get I think it's gonna be a lot of touches. Um, you know, we saw how he used Debo Samuel. Um, but I think it could be a more I think getting away from Shanahan, things could could open up more. Um, and I think that uh McDaniel's like a big wild card for this whole situation. Like, I think that you can keep things more simple for for Tua by by running some some short eight out routes routes, do using some screens, some sweeps, and you've got two wide receivers who can take it to the house on on any touch. I mean, we're not even talking about Jalen Waddle. Jalen Waddle had 104 catches last year, and you know we saw him in the draft. JD and I were in. He went like 17 overall. Um, it's a wide receiver heavy format, but Jalen Waddle, people were starting to take in the second round. Um, and, and now they've added Tyree kill. It's, it's just, it's just scary. I mean, I personally think it's, it's either the best wide receiver combination in the NFL or right there with, with, uh, Jamar Chase and, and T Higgins, but they've, they're absolutely loaded, um, at the top two wide receiver positions. So I don't, I don't know what the offense is going to look like, but I think it'll be, it'll certainly be exciting. 
Yeah, totally, man. I'm I'm pumped to see it. I, I like Tua this year as a buy low just without any of these additions. So now it's it's just pure money, especially if you got him early in these best balls and you know you, you made moves for him early in these super flexes. Guys, let's go uh from one loaded offense to a not so loaded offense. Um when you're talking receivers. Let's go let's go to my Colts, man. I'm pretty happy about Matty Ice ending up there. We'll we'll touch on the the rookies and, and the NFL draft and how all these moves are affecting that in a bit. So stay tuned for that, guys. Smash the like, smash the subscribe. You know the drill. Show your support. That's all we ask. We bring the winners. Bring guys like Mario here to drop the knowledge, the goodness. Let's talk Matty Ice, guys. Who are we liking in this indie offense? Obviously, Pittman uh, is you know coming off of a Wentz season, so he's got to be happy. As a Colts fan, I'm happy that we we dodged the the Baker Mayfield possibilities uh you know behind that offensive line mario i'll go to you first what do you like about this move if anything and who do you think benefits the most yeah i like it for the colts i think matt ryan is a lot better than his numbers looked last year and i think he was kind of just given a lose-lose situation uh that offensive line was really bad in atlanta uh i like Corderell patterson but the running back depth chart in general was brutal the receiver rotation might have been the worst in the league so most of those things are switching for the opposite with the move to the Colts and especially the offensive line, especially the backfield part. I guess the pass catchers could stand to improve, but they could improve them still yet. I mean, we still got the draft to go here. Uh, we'll, we'll see if they add a little more firepower yet. I still like Paris Campbell a lot, but with his injury history, I'm assuming they'll not count him to any particular extent. Um, so yeah, Pittman, I do think stands to benefit from the switch to Wentz to, from the switch from Wentz to Matt Ryan. Um, and somebody else is going to benefit too. I guess it could be Hines. I'm not inclined to see it that way. And, uh, apparently, apparently, uh, the GM, Chris Ballard is a little bit more partial to Hines than Frank Reich is. And, uh, apparently that's something that they kind of <laughs> struggle over, uh, because Reich prefers, uh, the better running back. Uh, be on the field, apparently, which wasn't obvious throughout uh, watching how they used Taylor and Mac and all those guys, but that's that's what it sounds like out of there. So I don't think it's going to be Hines. Uh, I am a Mo Alley Cox fan, so I'm definitely ready to uh, buy in on the hype there. But you think he stays indie? He's going to kill my Granton shares? Uh, Granton's an interesting player, too, and they could coexist. I mean, Doyle's out of the picture. So especially if they don't add a big name receiver, they yeah. could have two fantasy relevant tight ends especially since they basically play two different positions i like that Theo. yeah i mean i, I think that you, this is this is what uh seven straight years with a different um day one starter at quarterback so they keep the tradition going but at least they have um you know a veteran who i think i think he'll be um a little little less sporadic than than wentz potentially wentz's oh, yeah. final stats were, were not like horrific, but it just, I think Ryan gives them a little bit of stability there. Um, they've got a very good offensive line. They have the best, what I think is the best running back in the NFL. Um, and I think that for Michael Pittman, um, he's just one of those guys. I think he's, he's a, he's a wide receiver too um, in fantasy. Um, I don't think that he's going to, I don't think, I don't see him as a guy who's going to be a wide receiver one. I think he's a kind of a safe, you know, wide receiver two type play. Um, Ryan certainly doesn't hurt him. And what happens at the tight end will be interesting. And they're another team that I think could add a wide receiver in the draft. Um, I think it's a very good wide receiver draft, and I think that the Colts could definitely uh, go that way. All right. Before we um, – I know, Theo, you you want to pick Mario's brain. Uh, obviously, with the rookie draft, uh, the NFL draft approaching, we want to talk rookies. We want to see the effects. We have saw Malik Willis uh, pro day, so we want to talk about that. Let's do a quick rapid fire. We'll do a quick plug, and then we'll get into the rookies. We saw Leonard Fournette go back to Tampa Bay, which Theo were very happy. I don't know. I know Dan and I have a lot of LF. I, I you're you're pretty good with LF. No, or not? Yeah, I, I no, I have I have some, and I actually um he was a guy that I went out and got on contenders last year. Same. Like I would trade for him with and I, with and, Brady. You know, <laughs> so I'm with, very happy with with Brady, and and he was the kind of guy that I was you know, um I, I put I put some equity into and um. So I was thrilled that this happened. I mean, we go from we go from him potentially ending up in New England, um, where there was you know he visits New England into some horrible timeshare, killing um, two into, other guys' values. Absolutely, so into into him, you know, coming back to Tampa. I I'm 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 so happy about it. And also, 
I think that he's just kind of criminally underrated. Um, I posted on Twitter the other day, his, his last four seasons, um, his points per game have just been outstanding. I think last year, PPR points per game, he was like at 18. Um, and he had two, two big years before. And then his first year at Tampa was like 10 points a game. But three out of the last four years, he's been very usable. Um, and I think that he's the kind of guy that is going to be a, a value in, in redraft again. Um, and I think he's still a value in dynasty. He's 27. They just gave him a bunch of money. Um, he's going to co- go out and have a, a very strong year this year. So um, I'm, I'm very happy about the Leonard Fournette news. So what, what's your expectations for Fournette this year, Mario? Yeah, I think with Tampa Bay, it's just plug and play with him. And like you said, there was a lot riding on it. The question of where he signed and would have been disaster most other places, but Tampa Bay is the absolute best case scenario for him. And I think in hindsight, he disappointed a lot in Jacksonville uh, after looking so good at LSU, just because at LSU, he had the huge offensive line advantage at all times. And he would kind of get a big lane clear. And then once he's up to speed, he's this 240 pound, really fast guy. And it's tough to tackle a guy like that when he's moving. So with Tampa, their offensive line is so good. He's almost got the same deal there. It's like the, the lanes are there. And that's why he looks so much better is he's hitting speeds that he didn't with Jacksonville. And maybe more importantly than any of that, Tom Brady loves him. Tom Brady is a huge fan of Fournette, and you can see it. Like, you could see it early when they started working together. I don't know why. Who, I, I, I've never heard of anybody being a big Fournette fan other than Brady, but it's clear that he is. I like Fournette, man. I, I, I've always liked Fournette. I think he's, uh, he fits nicely in that offense. We saw it, and three years they signed him. So, like Theo said, if you picked him up late last year to dra- you know, pick him up for a contender, you're drafting him, hoping that he ends up back there uh, in Tampa. You're happy. Um, before we, we do a quick plug, guys, I'm, I'm, let's do a, ki- a quick keep trade cut here. Fournette back in Tampa. Tanyan back in Green Bay. Theo loves that I keep bringing up Tanyan. And A-Rob goes to the Rams. Uh, keep trade cut, Mario. We'll, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm optimistic enough for all those guys, I guess. Like, Tanyan, I don't know what to make of the injury, but with Adams gone, there's slack there to pick up. And he's he's probably their wide receiver, too, in function right now, you know, after, along with Lazard. And Tanyan's a really good athlete. Like, he ran a like a 4.58 at 236 or something, and he was a receiver at Indiana State. So, he could start catching passes right away. And um, sorry, what was what, – oh, Allen Robinson. Um, yeah, I uh, I was worried about him fitting in there with uh, Woods and Cup already on the field. But with Woods out of the way, it's got to be a huge upgrade for Robinson. And, and you would assume with that third receiver rep that they're going to get a little speed on the field, be it Odell Beckham or Van Jefferson. And as long as that's the case, then it should just be plug and play like last year. And uh, with, with Robinson, I think uh, – not like taking any of Cup's share, but doing more with uh, what Woods and Beckham tended to get. Uh, I'm not assuming a, a big year from Beckham exactly, probably like a slow start and a lot of uh, distance running on the outside. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, pretty optimistic for Robinson. Um, I think that this is, you know, the, the best quarterback he's ever played with. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a coach who's, who's going to know how to use him. Uh, and a scheme where we've seen multiple receivers have success in it, um, and playing a, playing opposite of a of an alpha like like Cooper Cup, um, I think certainly helps him as well. So I think Robinson could have a, a big bounce back season. Um, Tunyon is Tunyon is a, is a JD favorite, so it's uh, we, we we love talking a little 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 Tunyon. Um, he's interesting. It's like there's always this is always the time in, in the off season where you start trying to identify those those dirt cheap tight ends, um, either to get in dynasty or to fill out our best ball, uh, you know, our best ball rosters. Um, and right now, there's like a lot of pretty interesting dirt cheap tight ends. Um, Gerald Everett signs with the Chargers. He's not quite dirt cheap, but I'm I'm interested in him. Um, Tunyon, we just touched upon, and I'm interested to see what you both think of of Hayden Hurst landing in in Cincinnati. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Drew Sample is a blocker mostly, so it it seems like Hunter, uh, or sorry, Hayden, Hayden Hurst uh, might be running a decent amount of routes there, but I, I don't personally think he's as good as Uzoma. Like Uzoma's, I, I guess I'm just higher on Uzoma than most people. Like he's he's a big, really athletic tight end, and uh, Hurst is a pretty good athlete, but he's not as athletic as Uzoma. So 
he'll be he'll be good, I think. And so far as that role is basically just catching a, a screen, a check down now and then, and running a bit after the catch. And, and Hurst can do that. Uh, I just I'm not really expecting a whole lot for fantasy specifically. Was he in? Where was he in 2020? Atlanta, or excuse me, Baltimore, and then uh, he was in Baltimore, right? It was yeah. he was in Atlanta 2020 and last year in Baltimore before that, I think. Did Andrews get hurt in 2020? Uh, sorry, Hurst, what? Hurst had Hurst filled in and had, I believe, it was one one uh, big game um, when uh, when with Andrews Andrews missed. Hurst was a Hurst actually went was drafted before Andrews. Hurst was the first round pick. Yeah, no, the reason I um, ask is because he gave you nine top 12 weeks in 2020 yeah. and 11 top 24. So, I mean, he's done it right. And, and we, yeah. before they brought in pits in Atlanta, he, we thought, Oh, he's getting set up nicely there. When Hooper went to the Browns, the, the Falcons traded a second rounder. So I think that was two years in Atlanta and he's going into his third. No, oh, that's yeah, right. So yeah, that's right. The, the Uzoma call was an Around interesting him. one yeah. uh, though, Mario to add him in the mix of, uh, Dirt yeah. cheap buys. You, what, what's your expectations for him in, in New York? You think he's going to be uh, a decent part of that offense, or are you more of uh, you? You just like the talent. I think he's a good player, but Conklin's a good player too. And moreover, they're actually a little similar to each other. Like they, uh, Uzoma's more of an athlete, and he's bigger than Conklin. But they both have been functioning in that like five yards within the line of scrimmage kind of thing, and most of their production after the catch. So. Uh, at the very least, I, I don't see how the Jets are going to have enough points on the board to be running as many two tight end formations as it would take to get both of them on the field a lot. So th- throw in the workload uncertainty between the two of them and uh, probably a bad overall passing game there. I don't know if I expect either of Uzoma or uh, Conklin to do anything there. Yeah, it's always uh, – this time of year is always – I remember last offseason was, it was the Anthony Ferkser – People are always trying to find tight, trying to find tight end values. It's difficult. It's difficult, but um, we're always trying to identify them. Parham, Parham was another one. In, uh, Parham, yep. There was a the Parham Chargers. train. Yep. Absolutely. All right. We, we got to give a quick word to our, our, our friends over at the FFPC, myffpc.com, guys. I, I'm super excited because I got to admit, I know the cuts are coming, Theo, uh, March 31st, right, for Dynasty Leagues on the FFPC. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the cut down to? Do you, is it 16 or 20? So it's it's down to sixteen, including okay. your your defense and kicker. Okay. Um, and then, guys, uh, to my surprise, as I said, I, I didn't even know, and I'm excited because I'm dying. I don't know about you, Theo, but I'm dying for a startup, and they are back on the FFPC, the Dynasty startups, starting at seventy seven dollars, guys. Go check them out, man. There's nothing like playing Dynasty on the FFPC. Trust me, it's a totally different game than any other site you're playing on, whether it's MFL. Uh, it, it, the 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 level of play is awesome. Uh, Theo will tell you, man. Theo is all Theo is shooting like forty nine offers a day out there in the FFPC Dino leagues. Uh, Theo, g- give a little plug for uh, all the fun you're having out there. I mean, it's it's a great time. This is a very active time in the year um, for trades. You're seeing people square up the back end of their roster, you know, and there's always good values this time of year because you have to cut it down to a certain number. Some teams are loaded, some teams are not. So you see those, you know, fifth round picks for uh, running back X, Y, Z, some backup that, that has a little promise. You know, that kind of trade goes down. There's also orphans for sale. If you want to get a yeah. discounted team, pay a little bit less than you would for a dynasty startup. There's some pretty decent uh, orphan teams right now on both the FFPC and on the dynasty depot. Um, so definitely check it out. If you're looking to get some dynasty action, we all play on this site and we like it. Um, we are not so far away from, from rookie draft season, um, which is also an exciting time. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm trying to make moves, trying to get my dynasty rosters uh, as solid as possible. And if I'm rebuilding, I'm trying to sell off as many, as many parts um, that are not going to retain value. So this, uh, this is a great time of year to be a dynasty player, especially with all this offseason madness. Yeah, it, it creates such opportunity. You see it on the screen, guys. The main event, sign up now. A million dollars grand prize. That's right. One million dollars grand prize. 5.9 million prize pool money. And then, of course, the never too early best ball tournament is still going, guys. 25K for first, $125 buy in. Just a really nice best ball tournament. Very limited uh, with the seating. Do you remember, Theo, how many? I am. Bah, bah, bah. 
should probably. I don't. Re- I don't remember the. Uh, the they have the 583 total left. 583 yeah. spots left, and it's a thousand. Sorry, 1,152 teams limited to to that little team. So, guys, you look at other tournaments. Way more teams in there. Um, you can do live or slow drafts, and of course, you've got all the other best balls starting at five dollars for the slims, all the way to a kajillion dollars and all the other formats that they have on the FFPC. And guys, as you know, myffpc.com, if you're not already on the site, you're just hearing this for the first time, we appreciate you guys watching and listening. Make sure you tag us at Go District, and we'll get you a nice little sign-up bonus when you uh, sign up to the site. Guys, let's get into rookies. I know that first segment went way longer than we thought, but I thought, you know what, those are some big moves that happen in the NFL. Let's deep dive for our audience Let's uh, let's switch it up, Theo. Why don't you start it off? Why don't you start it off with uh, you know touching on these rookies? So uh, Mario is, is someone whose opinion I, I respect on on rookies. Um, I, I enjoy looking at his rankings, and and uh, I, I I just want to take a step back. How would you compare this class as a whole to maybe last year's class and the year before? Would you consider this a? And we'll take quarterbacks out of the equations. Just just skill position guys. Um, cause we already know it's a pretty down year for quarterbacks. Um, yeah. It, how, how would you look at this class? Are you intrigued by this class? Do you think it's a, uh, a decent class or is it, are you pretty down on it? I guess, uh, for certain, you know, especially in dynasty, certain people with certain teams might not find in this draft what they, what they need to, to get where they want to go. But in terms of just kind of a, a decent selection of talent of, of good players, productive players I think it's pretty good I maybe I tend to see things kind of like optimistically that way just because um I can get like really obsessive about some player and look at something and think like oh if they just did this differently with him this would work out better and so I, I can kind of see good case scenarios maybe that I shouldn't um so I I think it's a good class but with that said even an optimist about this class would have to admit it's it's not as good as the last couple ones uh certainly the running backs um uh, are pretty weak in this class. Like there's some totally good rotational prospects, you know, guys in like the you know, fourth, fifth, sixth round who you think, Oh, in that range, I'd really like to draft these guys, but not, not the stuff of, you know, projected starting lineups, you know, projected snaps. It's, it's a little harder to find that there. And then even at receiver uh, we've been spoiled the last couple of years. And I, I guess, especially two years ago when you had, you know, Jefferson in the first round, even last year with Chase and, and those those crazy guys, uh, you know, there's there's a little less depth last year, I think, than two years ago, even though two years ago had, had the star power. Uh, both of the last two drafts had a lot of star power at receiver. Uh, this year, I don't think there is. It's more like there's a lot of really good prospects, but there's no certainly no Chase, but I don't think there's any Waddle. There might not even be an Elijah Moore, but I might be higher on Elijah Moore than some people, too. So I, I don't mean that as a... I mean that more as a compliment to more than like a criticism of the guys this year. Do you, do you, I, I know you're working on, on your, your rankings. Do you have a top tier right now? Of- yeah, actually for me, the t- top tier is just Brees Hall. Like he's, he's the running back, the one who's going in the, maybe in the first round. And certainly he's, he's the, the one running back we can really, I think, assume a three down role for in the NFL. Um, I like Kenneth Walker a good amount too, but the, pass catching with him is a question whereas with Hall I don't think there's anything that's a question at this point I mean he has the exact same frame as Cam Akers did coming out of Florida State but he ran a better 40 he had better production for me anyway and college that than Akers so if Akers is the kind of guy who ends up on a good enough offense and, and goes you know right up into that running back one category Hall could have the same thing happen depending on where he lands and uh, he's the only running back in this draft who I think is just a clear three down player so uh, he's the top tier for me and then I'm, I have a really big tier two group because um, that's where all those receivers are. Basically it's like, there's, there's like the top six or seven receivers almost are kind of hard to parse out for me. Would it be, would it be landing spot dependent? Is that how close they are for you right now? Yeah. And there's also just kind of like, these are, these are players who are good at certain things for sure, but we don't know if there's going to be some team that gives them the chance to do that thing that they're good at. Like you might get a Terrace Marshall case where he goes to some team and they just they have him do everything that he's bad at and nothing that he's good at and he does terribly. Um, or you could get an Amon Ross St. Brown situation where you're like, well, we can we know he can play the slot, but we don't know if he's going to get a chance. We don't know if they're going to have some other guys getting in his way. We don't know if they're going to hold it against him that he runs a 4-6 and isn't that fast. 
But we do know that if he gets those slot snaps, he's probably going to be good. You know, he had everything. I guess it took half the season almost, but everything started to fall in his favor. And we saw like, yeah, this is what this is what he can do. Uh, But if he was on another team, he wouldn't have ever got that shot in the first place. So um, for me, it's kind of tough to take a hard stance between Drake London, at least until his pro day. If, If Drake London has just bombs at his pro day, he could maybe slip uh, out of this tier. But otherwise, for me, it's just Jameson Williams and Chris Olave are your speed guys. Uh, they're the ones who can make the big play. They're, they're the ones who can line up outside, take the top off of a defense. Garrett Wilson has speed like that, but I think he's a little more yards after the catch projected than those other two that I mentioned. They more can get open downfield specifically. And then I'm not out on Traylon Burks at all exactly, but for him to take the wide receiver one spot in the top prospect spot in this draft, he needed to be – a little bit more like A.J. Brown as an athlete and not the 4 5, five 40. He's still totally good. I mean, he could still be the first receiver picked, uh, could be a first-round pick, but it's it's just not what it could have been if he had tested better. Um, you, so you mentioned Alave, Jameson Williams, uh, Drake London, Garrett Wilson, and Traylon Burks. That's, I would say that's your top five in no particular order for wide receivers? Yeah, they're just all in one blob for me. Now, without looking at um, – for, for just taking a look at what we know today, who would you consider to be the safest of those five? And who would you have – who would you think would be the, the riskiest of those five? Man, uh, I think the most high upside might also be the riskiest, and that might be Drake London because – if he runs like a four six five at the USA, or the USC Pro Day – or his personal Pro Day, rather – that would be pretty concerning, but if he runs more like a, you know, I, I, this might be a stupid, impossible thing, but if he somehow runs like a high four four, like a four four eight or something, he all of a sudden goes straight to alpha workhorse wide receiver one kind of category for me. But if he tests poorly, you're talking more like a wide receiver two kind of category. Still could be a good player, but with these other guys, we have the hopes of like wide receiver one totally in play. Like it's it's not a. It's not that I'm trying to find a reason to rank, you know, Burks fifth out of them or, or uh, Garrett Wilson fourth out of them. Um, it, the landing spot will matter a lot. But, yeah, I think London has the most at stake on his workout, and he's the one that hasn't done the workout yet who will still run. Like, Jameson Williams won't be able to run because of that ACL tear. But London's going to run and jump, and if he bombs, it, it could hold a lot of sway over the rest of the receiver order. And if he does really well, uh, the same is true. Talk about uh, Alave uh, or or Garrett Wilson. If you could yeah, pick one so, of the Ohio State wide receivers, which one would you go with? I like them both a lot, but I prefer Olave just because I think he's a separation uh, creator. Like he's, I think he's going to get open in the NFL. But um, I think Wilson's going to get open in the NFL too. And and with him, you you would say he projects better as a yards after the catch guy than Olave. So uh, you know, it's like one of those things. I think Olave is probably the better player, but Olave might be more quarterback dependent than Garrett Wilson. Like, cause Garrett Wilson can definitely make yardage after the catch. So if he has a quarterback who can't throw more than eight yards, he could maybe still be okay. But Chris Olave needs someone who can throw, you know, a 12 yard out. There's a lot of wide receivers kind of in that next tier. Um, I want to pick your brain on George Pickens. And then I also wanted to see of all the wide receivers, that we expect to go maybe in the late first and second round, kind of after this this group of five, who are the wide receivers you're most intrigued with? Uh, maybe you could start with Pickens just because he's a guy that I'm interested in. Yeah, I like Pickens still, but to me he had a slightly disappointing combine. Uh, 6'3 is good to see, but he, he was 195 or something like that, which is pretty skinny for a guy his height. And the 44740 was only decent, in my opinion, for a guy with his density. Uh, if you're going to be skinny, I'd really like you to be like truly fast. Um, and, you know, sometimes 40 times are wrong, so I'm not trying to like bury him over this. I still like him as like a top 40, top 50 kind of pick. But before the combine, I had hopes of Pickens claiming wide receiver one. You know, he was he had really good production, especially that you know, true freshman year at Georgia. So I, I believe he has the skill to play receiver, starting NFL receiver at a high level. The question for me is what kind of physical tools does he have to work with? Because I think that goes a long way in determining upside uh, right now. I basically worry that he's uh, skinny to the point that it might hold him back a little bit. Like his frame and his timed athleticism is really close to what Josh Reynolds posted coming out of Texas A&M. So that's kind of concerning because he's okay, but he's, he's certainly no star. And with Pickens, 
I, I still hold out some hope that he's a star because that freshman year was just really impressive there. Um, Wandell Robinson. Uh, shout out to Joey Brown in the chat. Tell us your oh. thoughts on him. So I was disappointed with him because he was listed as 5'11 on uh, the, the height weight for uh, Kentucky, and then he measures at 5'8", which that's basically putting you in the slot. Like if you want to be a 5'8 outside receiver, you need to be Tyree Kill fast. And I don't know if the 4'4'4 or whatever it was Wandale ran, I, that might just make him this year's Jalen Darden or something. And I still like Darden, um, but, you know, with guys like them, their their projection is more fragile. Like they need – more things to go right, fewer things to go wrong. So if Robinson gets a shot on a good team if that has slot reps available, I love him in that case. I just worry about him getting that shot in the first place. David Bell? Yeah, he's he's tough because his production is awesome at Purdue, and it seems like he knows how to play receiver. But uh, the, the workout numbers were pretty brutal at the Combine, and this is a, a pretty strong class, so – uh, I think he slides a little bit, and you don't want to count him out. And if he lands on a good team, then you really like him. But, you know, worst-case scenario for a guy like his background is there's cases like Tyler Johnson and Kelvin Harmon, guys who were really good in college, and uh, they tested pretty poorly as athletes. And then, you know, they kind of, at the very least, have had a delayed start here. Yeah, I've, I've heard the, uh, the Kelvin, the Kelvin Harmon, uh, David Bell nightmare scenario um, I really would not like to see David Bell go that late in the draft. That would kind of just be a, a death sentence. Um, Even Tyler Johnson, I mean, he was awesome in Minnesota, and uh, yeah. So he, th- I, I really don't want to count him out because he can. It seems like he can definitely play. The only question is, it's like, is he going to be fast enough? Can he twitch, you know, jump quick enough to 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 make his skills show up on the field? Two, we'll we'll, we'll flip flip the switch. Two faster guys. Sky Moore and Christian Watson seem to be risers right now. Uh, a lot of people seem to be getting a little more excited about them. Watson had the big senior bowl, um, and and Sky Moore certainly did himself some favors uh, at the combine. What are your thoughts on those two guys? Are they guys that are, are those guys that you could see kind of sliding into the back end of a, of a first round in a rookie draft? Um, what are your thoughts on those two guys? Well, I don't want to count out Christian Watson because he's definitely got wheels and he can jump. That's definitely true. And he, he was a productive downfield player at North Dakota State, but um, he was never really a volume player there. And I do worry about him showing up in the low depth of target kind of part of the field. I even worry that he's going to basically be a better version of Marquez Valdez Scantling, like a guy who is outside and downfield pretty much every play, and you can't really count on him to make plays in the first 10, 12 yards. Um, but that speed is real. So if he can be a Marquez Valdez-Scantling who catches you know, 56% of his passes instead of 49, that could be a pretty good player, even if he's kind of limited. With Sky Moore, I can see him getting involved underneath and in the intermediate a lot more easily because he, he did that at Western Michigan. He was a super productive player there. And um, he helped serve there, too, against – two guys in the NFL, well, one guy, D. Eskridge, who's already in the NFL. Uh, Seahawks reached for him in the second round last year. Uh, But also Jaden Reed, who is going to be an NFL receiver from Michigan State next year. He's he's a good player. Uh, More kept up with guys like them. It put up really great production, had the good workout numbers and a pretty dense frame. So I I really like Sky Moore. I think um, I know he's gotten a little bit of recent hype, but I think it's pretty justified. Did you guys talk Spiller for um for oh, yeah. earlier? Okay. Uh, so just g- getting getting back to uh getting back to running backs. Um I want to touch on a couple of these guys, but Bre- Brees Hall is is he your 101 in Superflex drafts as well? Uh, probably. Yeah. Uh I, I like Malik Willis enough. He's my quarterback one. I guess it I guess it depends on how bad you need the quarterback there. So you would have those two guys as like the top tier in a super flex draft right now? Probably, yeah. Um, then looking at the rest of the running back uh, landscape, uh, I'd like to hear about some guys you like, but one guy you seem to have some some trepidation on that uh, I've seen a few people starting to sour on is Isaiah Spiller. He was a guy maybe if we were projecting this draft class a year ago, we might have said he's going to go you know pretty high. Um, what What are your concerns with him um, and is he a, a player that you think could could have, you know, bust factor based on his ADP? 
1080p. For me, Spiller is just in that pretty inclusive group of running backs who it's like if they got on the field and they, they got a decent chance to play, you could imagine them doing well. But to get that opportunity, you either need to have – usually anyway, you need to have clear standout talent – or draft capital kind of like, you know, greasing the runway for you, getting you on the field early. And um, the third case is injuries, of course, can, can get a guy on the field too. Um, but I think Spiller is pretty much dependent on the injuries to get the kind of opportunity that some of his biggest fans have in mind. And you got to keep in mind with him too, that that's a case where uh, the Dynasty Debbie community has had their hopes up for years and you got a lot of prior investments riding on him and, I understand why people don't want to hear bad news about that stuff, but it's like uh, so, some of the, some of the hype for him is just based on the fact that he was considered kind of like the best next guess at running back two years ago that people could make at the time. And uh, just because he might not have added to that resume and just because other guys might've popped into the picture won't really change that for people like that. Like they're just, they're just kind of still believing what they believed two years ago. And Spiller's been a good player at AM. It's not like he's given any reason for people to, sour on him that much it's just I, I think to get that level of running back opportunity that they have in mind you, you just got to show more than he has be it as production sense where I want specifically more explosiveness and more like really dominant games ideally against good defenses or you got to have the the rare tools to to project the gr- skill set growth with the you know the upside the big playability I just don't really see either so to me he falls into a group of you know like five or six guys who I think make sense in rounds three through five, but I, I do not see a standout prospect there. Is Walker your RB two in this class? Yeah, I like him enough. I don't, I'm not that sold on him. I think he could be just kind of like another Julius Jones or somebody that we forget about who has a few big games. Cause he's, you know, he runs hard and he's fast, but don't really see the star power there. It's, it's uh, I worry a little bit about him being kind of like another Daryl Henderson case too, where makes all these big plays as a runner in college um, but to, to make those plays in the NFL, you need to have the same relative speed advantage. And, uh, you know, if you, if you want to make four, three flat plays in the NFL, you need to have four, three flat speed. And uh, it's, it's a question as to whether Walker translates that big playability to the NFL. So um, I'm not, I'm not all, I'm not really uh, truly sold on him either. It's really only Hall that I'm truly sold on. Um, so I, Shout out to, to John John McGlynn, our boy in the chat. Um, what, he wants to know about Jerome Ford. Um, would Jerome Ford be a guy you're optimistic on? I guess I'm more optimistic on him than most people in that. So I was saying, uh, to me, Spiller just kind of lands in this group of guys who they're totally fine. If a team takes them in the mid-rounds, you won't fuss about it. You'd say like, hey, sure, why not? And uh, Ford is also one of those guys. Like, I don't have – a huge difference in my mind between Ford and Spiller. So to most people, that means I'm really high on Ford. Um, But it's more just kind of like I'm sooner agnostic, I guess. It's like, I I think all these guys could do okay if they, they get a shot. Um, But yeah, I I think Ford is basically as good of a prospect as Spiller, whatever, whatever that means to anyone. Rashad White would be in that mix of guys for you that are in that sort of mix. Yeah, I will say he's one that I have trouble figuring out what I think about him because he, he just doesn't look like that many running backs that I can remember seeing. I really like his production. You know, he's, he's done well as a pass catcher. His workout metrics were totally decent at the combine. So um, I'm definitely not sour on White. But again, he's, he's just kind of in that group where I, I have trouble uh, making a strong opinion on him. It, my, strong, my strongest uh, positive opinions at running back this year might be uh, Kevin uh, – what is it? <laughs> I barely know his name – because uh, I just I didn't I know his numbers more than I know his name, but uh, Kevin Harris from uh, South Carolina. South Carolina, yep. Yeah, because he 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 checks the boxes that I look for. Like I I prefer to see running backs who are over tw- two hundred and twenty pounds if possible, have explosive rushing production, and then plus athleticism on heavier than most frames. And Harris checks all those boxes. I think he would have much higher stock right now if he didn't have that back injury. Uh, that he was trying to play through early last year. If he had two years like his uh, two years in a row like the one that he had two years ago, people would be talking about him as the running back too, along with Kenneth Walker. Uh, that's what I think anyway, because he, he had 1,100 yards and really explosive numbers the year before he got hurt. So um, I like him quite a bit. And I'm less emphatically high on Isaiah Pacheco from Rutgers, but I am curious about him because uh, they've had, they had a couple 
just worst passing games of all time, brutal offensive lines. Uh, some of the worst football tape you'll ever see was at Rutgers when when Pacheco was trying to play. So he has ugly numbers at a glance, but I think he might not have had uh, much. I don't, I don't know how much more he could have done with how bad things were there. And, uh, you know, running the 4-4, four, four, whatever he did at 215. In a weak class, that, that gets me interested. Um, you mentioned the class is weak. I've asked a number of our guests this question. Where, where would be your cutoff in a, in a non-super flex draft where you're taking the random 2023 first round pick? Oh, oh like oh, are you see. trading the um, one oh like the one oh is the one oh seven the one oh so uh, I I'll just say I think it's weak at running back especially uh, in addition to quarterback I guess but uh, with that said yeah I think um so if I take a random first round pick for next <sighs> I'd seriously think about it if I was any further back than seven or eight yeah um, I think most people have said that, that seems to be yeah the the, the answer is at one oh seven. And then we're, we're, we're past the hour mark, but I do want to pick your brain. You, your QB1 is Malik Willis. Do you have an NFL comp? I hate, I hate doing that because he's different than all these guys. But, um, you know, how ex- I, and I will say how excited are you about him? Um, and is there a QB2 in this class that gets you uh, excited as well? I was initially way too low on Willis because he had some really ugly games as a passer. Uh, at Liberty, and, and that got me, you know, spooked by that. But uh, I, I think I was wrong to dismiss him initially, and um, not to make it sound like a slam dunk prospect because he's not. He he does have some really rough spots as a passer. But uh, I guess the best case scenario for him that you might think of is Josh Allen, who also had really brutal tape and numbers at Wyoming, especially his, his final year there. But uh, he also he had no no help really. You know, his offensive line and receivers were bad and. It was a pretty tough defensive conference in the Mountain West at the time. Uh, Liberty doesn't have the tough conference excuse, but they certainly have the bad surrounding uh, talent excuse. So Willis had a really bad offensive line, took a lot of sacks, and it's easy to miss this. I missed this first. Um, His rushing production last year was pretty crazy, actually, and it it looks good at a glance, but when you remember that the NCAA uh, subtracts sack yardage and adds a carry for every sack that uh, that a quarterback gets, He's actually averaging something almost like eight and a half yards per carry last year instead of the four and a half that it shows as. And I don't know what his 40 time is or at his particular weight or whatever, but if he's got wheels to work with, and it sure seems like he does, numbers like the the, the rushing numbers that he posted last year make me think he's going to be the second best running quarterback, uh, as in the, the, the second most voluminous rushing producer at quarterback after Lamar Jackson. So if that's true, I almost – in fantasy anyway, I don't even care how bad he is as a passer at that point. You got that right. I mean, if he's if he's any anywhere near Lamar Jackson as, as a rusher, um, then he's going to be fantasy uh, friendly, as we like to say, in the GOAT district. Um, and, and then I don't want to waste your time here because it doesn't seem oh, no, like there's... anybody anybody's extremely excited about this tight end class. I'm excited about Trey McBride. Um, is he your tight end one? He is. It's it's kind of by default a little bit, and especially with uh, Isaiah Likely from Coastal Carolina. He kind of bombed at his pro day, and Jalen Weidermeyer of Texas A&M really bombed yeah. at his. So those two were both kind of on the day two radar for me, and now they're barely on the draft board, if at all. So the, t- uh, the tight end class took a big hit with those two, I think, falling out of the picture. Um, but Trey McBride, I mean – it's not easy to think of past cases like him exactly, but it is safe to say, uh, you know, you don't see production like his very often at all. It's kind of like once every 10 years kind of thing. So uh, depending on his workout numbers are, you know, if he has the kind of speed and quickness to, to get open in the NFL the same way he did in college, I think he should translate and uh, you know, he's not heavy or anything. So he needs to, to run at least decently for me. But, you know, you see the production at Colorado State, the skill element is beyond any question there. And just to put some context into McBride, because um, I know you're, you're – I like how you're able to go back and look at past draft classes. I'll throw out two random guys. Cole Komet, who was close to the tight end one, drafted as the tight end one, but I'm not sure if he was your tight end one two years ago. Uh, Cole Komet and then Pat Fryermuth, who – would have been a tight end one in a normal year, but he happened to be in the same year as, as Kyle Pitts. How would you compare Brick Bride to those two guys? Do you think that's a reasonable expectation 
that he could be somewhere in between them or, or is he below those guys? Well, uh, Cole Komet's a huge lumbering tight end. So I like McBride being more, uh, let's see, 246 at six, four. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he could be like a, was Owen Daniels or somebody like that? Kind of like that. Like, I, I like, he, the, I love that comp. I like, that. like I'll a guy who's, you know, running around a lot with the ball kind of tight end. Yeah, we'll take we'll take uh, the next Owen Danielson tight end premium, won't we, JD? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not that's not getting me unexcited. That's great. JD, is there any prospects you want to want to get uh, Mario on the record on right now? I, sorry, guys, I'm on mute. I keep I keep throwing it out there, and <laughs> I, I'm thinking I'm talking, and, and I'm on mute there. Um, no, I mean he he hit on a lot of them. The one I wanted to hear the most was Rashad White. Unfortunately, one of my most owned. Uh, uh, play, rookies on on the FFPC. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we'll see how that how that plays out. If you um, squint, if you squint hard enough, Mario. If you squint, 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 can you see a little David Johnson with Rashad White? He's not that heavy, but you could use him some of the same ways, specifically as you know the the, the route running aspect. So uh, that's part of what I mean. Why uh, I like White, but I can't quite tell what to think about him. You know, because I'm like, man, if he was just ten pounds heavier, I'd say David Johnson. But I don't, now I don't know what to say. Um, but he seems like he's a good player and he does the same kind of tricks, you know? Yeah. Uh, actually, Zamir White's a guy that, uh, Theo, Dan and I fight over in every best ball that we enter together and and he keeps going earlier because we want to one up each other and and get him before the other does. John McGlynn, our buddy, uh, friend of the show asking about Zamir White shooting up draft boards. He's uh, for me. He's in that group again with Spiller and Ford, and there's other guys that are in that group too that I'm forget. I guess the, maybe the maybe the South Dakota State guy is up there after having- Robinson. Robinson's in there. Uh, I'm actually lower on Robinson than most people, but okay. uh, the other thing I feel like I should mention is I don't think the 40 times for the running backs uh, are right this year. I think they're all wrong at the combine. I think they're all the too new fast. new turf. New turf was the was the theory. Well, well the other thing is they. T- Oh, Mario, Mario's frozen. Still, which is the opposite of how it always works and how it worked with the receivers. The receivers, we were told, like, you know, uh, Christian Watson ran a 4-2-8, and then they changed it to a 4-3-6. With the running backs, they said, hey, Brees Hall ran a 4-4-4, which is already very good. And then they're like, actually, it's a 4-3-8. And so did everybody else got a .06 subtracted or something like that. So I think Robinson ran a 4-6. I think Kyron Williams ran a 4 7 there's a, There's a bunch of other cases. I, I think the 40 times are all wrong. Um, so I, I don't think white is as fast as the 40 time implies, but if that, if I'm wrong about that, if he is, you know, a low four, four guy, um, who can run the, on the, on a, you know, two fifteen frame who can run the way he did at Georgia, that should play in the NFL. Um, that, that there's no reason that should not be useful to some team who needs to, you know, get some carries assigned to somebody. Theo, you had your uh, asking for a friend type of question. I'm going to ask mine as I'm sitting here trying to wheel and deal. I- I'm, try- I'm trying to score um, DeAndre Hopkins. I-, I have zero shares. He's not someone I've been buying in the previous years, but I feel like right now he could be a pretty nice buy uh, in Dynasty. A 23 first and a 23 second. That's too much, right, for Hopkins? I wouldn't. I would try to. I would try to move a a, a twenty-two. Uh, I already did that. For, I already yeah. did that, and he just got back to me. And he's a guy that doesn't use his picks. He trades them. So he's saying he's he's looking for twenty threes, and he already has two offers for twenty three first. And I'm I'm pretty much top two every the last few years. So he knows mine's going to be late. I would. I would. I would. Unless you know you're absolutely going to win the league with with the addition of D hops. And you're going to get cash out of it, then I would I would struggle making that trade. I I like trying to trade for D Hops right now. I agree with you. I think he's like a third round redraft type guy, um, so he might be he's, he's pretty cheap based on his age and dynasty. But I think that that could burn you. Um, you know, if he gets hurt and a couple of your other guys get hurt, even if it's a contender, contenders become non playoff teams pretty quickly, um, especially in non deep you know dynasty formats. So. Uh, what do you think? What do you think, Mario? Is that a something you would do, or? So I don't handle uh, like pick trades like that as much as you guys, and I I did I don't mean to um, pretend to know a whole lot about it, but I, I think I, I I lean a little bit more with Theo. Uh, I'm I'm concerned about Hopkins's durability situation. First of all, like he's 
he's been getting nicked up quite a bit lately and he is reaching that age where you're like oh man I'm not I don't want to just assume he's going to bounce back fine at least not as quick as he used to um so adding that second pick maybe makes me a little more concerned but uh even a bad season for Hopkins is still you know assuming he doesn't get hurt a bad season for Hopkins is still 100 plus catches so in PPR I don't think he can hurt you as far as two projection all right Let's do a, a quick – guys, remember to use district, the code district on underdog. You guys have to be on underdog. If you're not already on there, the best mobile app to draft, uh, best balls. If you're in a hockey, they've got the Zamboni right now for the playoffs. If you're in a basketball, they've got a basketball. Uh, they've got tons of sports on there, baseball draft starting. So go check out underdog. Use the draft or the code district. You'll get up to $100 matched in your account when you sign up uh, using the code. And stay tuned to the channel, man. I know, Theo, you haven't jumped in yet, but we've done um, – uh, we, we, Dan and I jumped on for a couple. We did one that was planned, and one was like a late Saturday night. Uh, both of us, after a couple of beers, jumped on and, and did a draft. So that was a fun one. Go check that out, guys. Um, but Mario, man, always bring in the goodness. We love having you on, man, especially like, like Theo said, the timing to get you on today was just, <laughs> was just priceless, man. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really uh, like hanging out with you guys, and and I, I appreciate all the the generous words. And it, it's uh, it's all likewise to you too. I appreciate that as well. Um, and yeah, we'd love to have you back on um, sometime in the summer, like we did last year, and, and uh, you know, talk a little more redraft. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd definitely like to do that. Hundred awesome. percent. And shout out to Wheeler in the chat. You guys are awesome, man. John McGlynn, we appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, you know, Joey. Uh, and we had Matt in here as well and, and a few others. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. Guys, smash the like, smash the subscribe. Make sure you check out Mario um, Rotowire at the – remind me, remind me. The, buddy, I keep the posting scout. Yeah. The posting scout. I don't know why I keep forgetting posting. The posting scout. Uh, pretty simple and then, uh, handle and a must-follow, guys. And we have a couple of great guests lined up the next couple of weeks. We have Dwayne McFarlane coming back on the pod again. Um, Dwayne's great. Um, we have Jax Falcone of the Undroppables has been a fantastic guest here on the Goat District multiple times now. Uh, and then we have Abib Agbatoba coming back on, the two-time football guys uh, champion. We'll get a high-stakes perspective on some of these off-season moves. Um, and Abib is, Abib is a fantastic guest as well. Uh, this will be, I believe, his third time on the Goat District. So stick with us. If you love the show with Mario uh, tonight, you love some of our previous shows, um, you know, expect more great things. We've got um, a lot, a lot of content coming uh, heading into the draft. Uh, and then we have some great stuff planned the week of rookie drafts as well. So I know that we're, we're in that jam-packed week between the NFL draft and our rookie drafts. J.D. and I and, and Dan are talking about some ideas for that week, but we're going to have some, some really good guests as well. Yeah, man, we're going to spoil you guys as much as we can. We're doing it. You know, Theo keeps bringing in the guests. We keep bringing in the goodness. Listen to, listen to Wheeler, man. Smash the like, guys. It's a small thing. I know it sounds stupid and you hear it all the time, uh, but it, it really helps the show. It helps the, the show spread uh, the goodness to all the peeps out there. If you want to get those stacks, guys, you're in Dynasty. Maybe you don't have Tua. You know, maybe you don't have Hill. Go get yourself a stack on Underdog, MyFFPC. Go, go draft yourself a new Dynasty, man, on MyFFPC right, right now. Uh, tons of fun on both those sites. We appreciate you guys. Check out Radiant Global for all your GOAT gear, including this sweet JT shirt. We appreciate Mario. Theo, always a blast with you, brother. You're the man. Dan, hope you're rocking out right now, and we'll check you all later. You know the Pope listens Dynasty our religion For the blokes missing On all of these trades On all of these plays On all of these grades By the end of the day Y'all getting played So what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex Send the homie a text That trash off is the best You try to make it complex Then they text you back Now all of a sudden They don't make any sense <laughs> Broaden your horizons boy Dynasty's not for the Simons boy these trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T district, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's the... And I always be traded. Traded, traded, traded.
and I always be trading. Trading. And I always be trading. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta pay them. Fish, fish, fish. That was an awesome show again, Mario. That was really, really fun. I love being able yeah. to pick your brains on these prospects, man. You're like a machine with this shit. Uh, we covered, I mean, we covered a lot gotta... of shit there. We covered a lot of shit there in one one eighteen. That's for sure. Yeah, sorry if I dragged anything out too much. No, but, man, not uh, at all, dude. We, we we were that's we appreciate all. Do, of you, do you ever do you ever podcast with with um John John? Are we're still we're still we're still live, uh, JD? Uh, are we really? <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. All oh. right. All right. We'll, we'll turn it. All I was right. Gonna say we. I was I was gonna I was gonna say that um we've had a we've had a couple of guys that, that you would 